Uh, so we're going to move on into our panel, which is on uh, perspectives of cyanobacteria risk. And um, our panelists are Leslie Dianglada from the uh, U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, Bridget O'Brien from the Vermont Department of Public Health, Karen Malkus from the Town of Barnstable Health Division, and Warren Muir from the Wolf Borough Waters, the Citizen Sciences Group. Um, so how about we start by having each panelist uh, tell us a little bit about their position, their uh, perspective on cyanobacteria risk, and their approach to management. Then uh, we'll open up to questions, and then we'll start the discussion. So um, Leslie, would you like to start? Sure. Um, all right. So risk communication, I was, I was telling uh, um, in, in, the, in the chat room that uh, developing the risk assessments or the health advisories for the cyanotoxins was not as hard as communicating what does those values mean. Um, you have, for the first time, EPA developed health advisories for two, well, we did that for uh, nitrates, but for the first time we developed health advisories for two different populations. Um, that were exposed to this um, particular chemical that we call. Um, and so we started thinking, what effect will that have if people doesn't know or really understand what having two populations being exposed to the same contaminant uh, and, and the, the, how to communicate that risk. So we, we had a public meeting back in 2014 um, in, in Chicago and we ask, you know, what do you need? And basically the, 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 the item that was uh, asked for EPA was just provide us with a guide on how we um, interpret, how we uh, apply these health advisories, which are not regulations, are just a recommendation. So um, we develop a recommendation documents that explain step-by-step step why, how, to uh, manage the cyanotoxins in drinking water and how to interpret the values um, and, and use uh, uh, public health measures uh, to follow up. Um, EPA, um, in addition to develop health advisories, as I mentioned in the, in the presentation, we also try to uh, engage uh, and outreach uh, and, and, and try to bridge that um, path with the states uh, regarding communications. Uh, we develop a, um, a, a website. We, uh, again, we publish uh, the newsletter every month uh, trying to bring, you know, what, what, what is going on, what is the new literature, uh, what are the events. Um, and, and I think uh, based on our limited, uh, um, let's say based on my limited uh, risk, uh, other than uh, conducting risk assessments. Uh, the risk communication is, is very important and EPA is trying, at least the Office of Water is trying to um, uh, reach out as much as we can to communicate those risks. I'm gonna stop there to let others talk. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, how about um, we have Bridget O'Brien for next? Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. All right, great. Um, so I'm Bridget O'Brien. Um, I work at the Vermont Department of Health in the Environmental Health Division there. Um, and in Vermont, we really try to create an awareness of the issue of cyanobacteria blooms. And uh, we really go by the slogan of when in doubt, stay out. Um, so while we do have vo uh, volunteer cyanobacteria monitors who report what conditions they're seeing, they go out and report conditions that they're seeing based on a visual assessment, just by looking at their water, at the water with their naked eyes. Um, and then they report those uh, to us. They're reviewed by staff and if approved, they're posted to our cyanobacteria tracker along with the photos of what they've seen. So that's a good educational tool there just for people to see what, what is being reported as a bloom or not. Um, and this is a great tool for noting where cyanobacteria blooms have been reported recently. Uh, so that said, we really want everybody to learn what cyanobacteria blooms look like, not just the trained cyanobacteria monitors, 
and we want everybody to scan the water for them before um, using the water because even widespread volunteer monitoring does not cover every location all the time. And bloom conditions, as we know, can change pretty rapidly. Um, so that conditions um, that you see at 3 p.m. may be different than what was reported at 11 a.m. Um, and then additionally, of course, people do have private access to water bodies and ponds. So they need to be able to identify the risks um, for themselves at those locations. But then once we hear of blooms and they're confirmed via photographs, um, we post them on that cyanobacteria tracker so that anybody with an internet connection can see where they've been reported in the photos. Um, we then try to work with our community partners um, like the town health officers or park or beach managers to close swim areas where appropriate um, or post other signage to alert people to the conditions and conduct outreach um, on park websites or town websites, town forums, Facebook pages. Um, you know, in Vermont, a lot of the communities are small and there's, there's various communication within the communities that as a state, we can't get down to that level. So working with community partners is really um, really a huge role. Um, and we feel pretty comfortable using this visual approach um, as at some locations where the visual observation is made, water samples are also taken. And we've looked at that data over the years and seen that the cyanobacteria cell counts um, where less than bloom levels have been reported are quite low and the toxin levels have never been over our Vermont Recreational Water Guidelines. Um, even the day following a bloom when you might con be concerned that the bloom has died out and toxins have been released into the water. Um, so we do do that and take a look at those data as well. Um, but I think to sum it up, our strategy is really to increase the education on what cyanobacteria blooms are and what they look like, and then try to encourage folks to be on the lookout for blooms, report them when they see us, so that we can work with the partners to get the word out to those who might be less educated about this issue. Um, and then uh, as always, our messages, when in doubt, stay out. Um, well, thanks. Great, thank you. Um, Karen uh, Malkus. Uh, hi, I'm gonna do a quick hi with video, but I have terrible bandwidth, so I'm just gonna say hi, and then you're just listen, I hope. <laughs> thank That's you. Good. So um, good afternoon to everyone. My name is Karen Malkus Benjamin, and I work for the Barnstable Health Division on Cape Cod. Um, when most people think of Cape Cod, they envision primarily the recreational waters as the ocean beaches, but actually the Cape has 996 ponds, according to the Cape Cod Commission, and many of these ponds are used for recreation. Massachusetts has about 3,000 ponds in total, so the Cape actually has a third of the ponds in Massachusetts. So with so many ponds and the possibility for exposure to cyanotoxins increasing, this is a big issue for us, for both the residents and the visitors, and we really thought it was important to evaluate the risk. The town of Barnstable itself has about, or they say 182 ponds, and until 2015, like other Massachusetts towns, we addressed cyanobacterial blooms solely by using state technical assistance and guidance. Uh, between 2009 and 2014, we saw beach closures increasing due to harmful cyanobacterial blooms. But meanwhile, the health division did not have experience sampling cyanobacteria and nor any local toxic measurement tools for quick responses. So this is a big turning point. Uh, beach closures from pathogens measured by E. coli are rare in Bonstable and management is supported locally by the county, but we felt we were unable to provide the public with effective information about health risks from cyanobacterial blooms. And we understand that cyanotoxins are high on the toxicity scale compared to other waterborne toxins, so we felt that exposure to cyanotoxins represented a potential risk to the public health that we needed to address. So accordingly, in 2015, we started collecting baseline data in-house. Uh, we use a triage strategy to pick sites for monitoring, focusing on ponds with bloom history, public beaches, and ponds with high recreational use. And we prioritize places with more vulnerable, vulnerable populations like dogs and children. In 2017, we partnered with the Association of, to Preserve Cape Cod. We had cytoscope training with EPA's Hillary Snook and learned about cytocasting from Nancy Leland at LimTech. Uh, aiming to keep our costs down and with our new knowledge, we actually put together a toolkit for cytobacterial bloom risk analysis. 
And the key tools were the sino monitoring and the sino casting protocols. Uh, we focus on species dominance and growth rates, looking at log phase change in the cyanobacterial populations and the toxins. In late 2017, research by Nancy Leland and Jim Haney used Cape Cod data to investigate relationships between toxin production and fluorometry data. And from that data, they developed regression equations, which we have used to predict microcystin levels starting in 2018. We also use a Praxis microcystin test strips for toxin screening. And only when clearly needed, we actually send samples off offsite for toxin tests, but that's only when we can afford it to. Last year was a little tricky, but we did our best. Um, to communicate to the public, our toolkit uses three categories of risk. The goal is to help the public respond to different incremental severities of the toxic blooms and to help them assess the probability of health effects. We have three levels, pet advisories first, then warning and closure, and the closure is guided by state and EPA criteria. So to express my current view of cyanobacterial risk, I must clarify that I'm extremely humbled by the complexity of harmful, harmful cyanobacterial blooms, HCBs, and each pond, each season, and each bloom is unique. Yet, if we monitor individual ponds weekly and watch the patterns of bloom dynamics with our toolkit, we can get helpful information to forecast microcystin exposure and share more timely information with the public. Next, though, is to get a handle on toxins beyond microcystin and to look in more depth at benthic toxic cyanobacteria. And there was a pun intended there. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me today, too. Thank you, Karen. Uh, and now uh, we'll have Warren Muir. Hi, uh, I'm Warren Muir. And by way of background, uh, I spent uh, over 40 years in Washington. I'm a scientist, a, 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 a PhD chemist and environmental scientist. And I spent 40 years in DC uh, at, at sort of the top of the career level um, in the executive office of the president and uh, uh, heading the toxics, the first uh, head of the toxics program at EPA, uh, but also heading a, a nonprofit organization that uh, uh, provided independent uh, science advice to local communities with hazardous waste sites uh, and ending up uh, being the executive director at the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering, Medicine and National Research Council over all the environmental activities there. But I'm, but I'm here in the, I bring that perspective, but, but I'm here in the capacity of a, of a local citizen in Wolfboro, New Hampshire, uh, where my family's had, a, 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 has, has come since 1951 and where, uh, where I currently uh, live, um, we built uh, as a family in 1953. Um, and, uh, in, in Wolfboro, uh, we, uh, our, our house is on Lake Winnipesaukee, the largest lake in New Hampshire. Um, but there are seven water bodies that are wholly or within, uh, partially within the, the town of Wolfboro. Uh, and, the, and the water bodies are, I mean, the center of the community. That's why so many people are there. Um, and, uh, uh, and so people care, care about the lakes and, and the water and the water quality. Um, over the decades, uh, my family has observed uh, uh, by our, our house a, a significant degradation in the water quality that, uh, of, of the lake, and we were concerned. Um, and uh, several years ago, I volunteered uh, to be one of the, the samplers uh, for the UNH Lakes, uh, Lay Lakes Monitoring uh, Program, and it was collecting samples. Uh, in uh, in Winter Harbor, which which is where our property is, um, and then um, then things changed uh, at the uh, at, at the end of August in 2018, when right near our house we had a significant bloom of Gliotrichia uh, that ended up resulting in a New Hampshire DES uh, advisory, and which was the first such report of a bloom. Uh, on the Seven Lakes in Wolf World. Uh, and um, and uh, it really um, ended up uh, with, with quite a community, uh, quite a community reaction. Uh, the, uh, the, 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 town, the town 
selectmen uh, wanted to be briefed on on uh, on, on the bloom. Um, uh, they set up a town uh, committee, uh, originally an ad hoc committee to really look into things and now have set up a, a standing committee, which is what we call Wolfboro Waters, um, which I'm on and had the assessment uh, activities. Um, uh, they uh, were interested in, in finding out about uh, uh, the risks of cyanobacteria, uh, trying to uh, get ahead of the uh, uh, risks of cyanobacteria blooms on our waters and do what they can to prevent it uh, so that uh, uh, the waters uh, will uh, continue to have the recreational and other values uh, that, that they always, always have had. Um, uh, 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 the town voters have uh, voted um, monies to fund, uh, I mean, nobody's paid on this committee, uh, but uh, expenses associated with various things. Um, uh, they paid for uh, a watershed management plans uh, that uh, on, on, on the lake to try and identify uh, the, the greatest uh, uh, sources and, uh, of concern. Um, and as part of our, uh, our efforts, we're, we're trying to uh, figure out, um, it, one of the things we've recognized is that the, the measures that we are, are getting through the volunteer sampling and one of our lakes is, I guess two of our lakes are involved with the state uh, volunteer uh, sampling program and measurement and, and the rest with, uh, with UNH. Um, but they get similar measures, but that those measures that we were collecting uh, aren't the measures of, um, of the risks of all the different types of cyanobacteria of concern, and in particular, the ones that, that bloomed at the time, because we happen to have a measure the very day of the, uh, of, of the bloom, uh, and, uh, and the, measure, the measures on like total phosphorus, said everything's great, uh, and meanwhile, we were having, having uh, uh, an advisory. Uh, so we're trying to figure out what it is that we should be measuring to assess the risks of future cyanobacteria blooms. Um, and, and then presumably that measure would be useful uh, in measuring the success um, uh, uh, of our mitigation and prevention activities. And, um, and maybe that uh, would drive the priorities uh, for prevention and mitigation activities, because there's only a finite budget uh, uh, for uh, for acti activities. Um, so um, it's um, it's been a challenge, uh, but we uh, have been participating with the collaborative, um, working closely with New Hampshire DES, uh, uh, working uh, with um, scientists at uh, Bigelow Labs in in Maine. Uh, we've been doing things like DNA, even DNA analysis and so forth, um, and uh, but uh, but really trying to we're we're trying to we oh the, uh, uh, Shane uh, and Hillary came up and 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 brought up the mobile lab and did a great job of training people on cyanobacteria um, uh, uh, identification bloom identification. Over 80 people in the local community signed up for that. So, uh, so people are, know what to look for uh, and we've told them how to report so that everything gets uh, uh, quickly, uh, quickly addressed. Um, but uh, but we're, we're really trying to figure out how to um, do what we can uh, to, uh, to, to limit uh, or prevent uh, future cyanobacteria blooms. Uh, and not just respond to the conditions. Great, thank you. Um, and now we can open up the, um, we can start the discussion and we can start from, uh, if you have any questions, you can put them on the chat uh, or you can raise your hand. Oh, I see Max. Max, do you have a question? I, I do, and um, I tried to write it down, but I'm, it's still a kind of confusing question, but I know that this is the right group of people to ask it to, so if I miss this opportunity, I'll, I'll be sad. And um, this, so this is kind of my question. In, you know, in Massachusetts, we, 
the Department of Public Health uses the 70,000 cells per milliliter um, threshold to talk about risk to the public. And, um, you know, obviously with the, the kind of 2019 EPA guidance coming out there, you know, it's kind of this community is really moving away from these cell density thresholds, you know, saying that there's not a very good link between that and risk. And I really appreciated what, um, what Ingrid was saying yesterday about, you know, well, you may want to have a, a chlorophyll to toxin ratio that you understand locally. Um, but, but my question is kind of as, as we're shifting away from these rules of thumb that were kind of easy to understand and easy to apply, but maybe extremely inaccurate, um, it seems like two things maybe are happening. You know, one is that there's way, way, way more local knowledge that's needed and much more local knowledge than can even, you know, certainly exists right now. And the other thing that maybe is happening is that, you know, I, I appreciate Bridget's perspective on when in doubt, stay out. But, you know, I wonder if we are maybe being in certain cases excessively cautious when it comes to you know, thinking about some of these blooms in, in recreational waters. And I would just love to hear if other people are, you know, how folks are kind of thinking about this question or this issue, if that makes sense. I'm glad to respond to that. Um, and it's a big one because I don't want to be overly cautious or under cautious. And it's very hard to tell because we actually have ponds that look pretty good and they're toxic. And then we have ones that look horrible and aren't so bad. So a lot of it, I think for me, are, is the phycocyanin tools. And with the cyano monitoring and cyano casting, using the zapper to collect the BFCs, which are the bloom forming colonies, are particularly helpful for Dolochi spurnum and microcystis and some other species too that are buoyant, obviously. I am still terrified about the benthic one, the benthic blooms. We don't really have a handle, and I think everyone is. But the phycocy you know, phycocyanin has really helped a lot in terms of looking at populations and their dynamics. And if you're getting clear sense of the dynamics, then you can t you you know you have a lot of cells. <laughs> and so for me, I you know, it's not always exactly seventy thousand. I actually am more worried about the the way it's changing, the populations changing, and how how we're getting into you know the how those are maybe reflected in the toxin levels. Um, the other issue for me is when to reopen, um, you know, because it, it looks good too then, but the toxins are still prevailing in the water and different toxins last longer. So, but I, I agree with your question. I think it's changing a lot and I, I expect a lot of new regulatory changes in the coming years. I have a quick question for you, Karen. So um, you said that one of your, concerns is how to reopen. So how do you approach uh, that right now? Um, um, so basically we, we keep monitoring as we have done before. And I that's typically when I actually do the screening for toxins. And I've, if I'm still getting something, I always wait once we've had a closure and it's clear that we have a bad bloom and it's toxic. I, I do this sort of rule of thumb where you wait two weeks or you, you do two weeks of testing and see what's going on there. It's complicated and it, it, each pond is different, as I said, and you have to kind of get to know them and get to know your bloom. So it's, it's like taking care of a child <laughs> in some ways. So it's, it's no, there's no quick answer, but usually using toxins and who, what kind of exposure and what time of year. I mean, it's the end of the season in October or November when everyone's gone home and we don't have a big population of people swimming. They're just fishermen. You know, I might handle it differently than I do in July. So it's a constant sort of debate. Thank you. Um, does anybody I, else I have think For our, our community, um, we're guided by the state. The state issues an advisory that tells people they should avoid contact with the water. Um, the, uh, I mean, it's an advisory. Uh, it gets posted uh, and that's what the town um, fathers uh, uh, and mothers uh, uh, share uh, share with with the community, uh, but what we're trying to do um, uh, is um, uh, try and get some rapid uh, assessment of the level of the toxin in the uh, in the water, uh, which which was not available at the end of 2018. It wasn't until months later that we found out that the concentrations were not uh, uh, of concern, um, and try and get some measurements back. 
um, and, and feed those into New Hampshire DES uh, 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 to see whether uh, they think that they should uh, 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 remove, the, uh, remove the advisory. Uh, so we've, um, uh, DES has got the ability to, to do turnaround on, on, uh, on, on cyanotoxin uh, concentrations uh, faster. Uh, and we've got like Bigelow Lab uh, that will uh, try and get us some, uh, some rapid results. Um, because, uh, you know, the bloom in two, 2018 it was at the end of the season, but it was almost a month long. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, if, and if it's not of concern, uh, we'd like uh, people to be able to return to the water. I, this is um, Bridget again. Um, I guess a couple points. Yeah, I mean, I appreciate the when in doubt, stay out, um, seeming conservative, but I think um, I think it's a recommended thing to do. Um, it's the CDC guidance as well. Um, and, you know, we just want folks to stay safe. We do understand that, um, you know, beaches want to reopen after blooms, absolutely. Um, some of them we're working with um, are using the Abraxas um, microsystem test strips. Um, and we have been doing those along with the sample to our lab to see how they're performing and they have them performing well, um, despite our lab test not actually being a Braxis brand, um, meaning the antibodies are, are different, um, but they're, they've been actually more conservative uh, in general than our um, lab test, though, you know, in the same, in the same range there for sure. Um, Karen also brought up uh, benthic, um, which is another thing, you know, we've seen in Vermont and um, certainly is worrying and it's a kind of a different message um, for what folks should, you know, look out for. Um, we had, you know, been talking about the stick test a lot. Hey, if you can pick it up with a stick, that's not cyanobacteria. Don't worry about it. Um, turns out that's, you know, maybe not the message that we should be saying. But the good news there is, um, and in speaking with some colleagues in California in the past, and you know, based on what Ingrid said yesterday as well, is that the bigger concern there, and this is what we've seen in Vermont too, a lot of times is the dogs eating that, eating that mass of benthic stuff, less so than the water having elevated toxin levels from the benthic, um, because it dilutes out at that point and, and isn't usually seen so high there. So that, that gives me a little bit um, of a sense of, um, you know, less concern there than maybe you could have. Um, and so I think the messaging there um, is for, you know, parents and pet owners to watch what your kids and dogs are doing, which should be the case either way. So I, I really liked um, in Becky's presentation, the, I forget what it, exactly it was called, but um, healthy water, um, you know, healthy water behaviors to do before going in. We want folks to scan the water, but that should include a benthic scan for that kind of stuff as well. Thank you. Um, I guess we'll move on to another question. Does anybody else have a, another question? Oh, I, I would just say to notice that there's a few things that people are posting in the chat, sort of sharing their experiences so and their thoughts. I don't know if you want to read one of them. Do out. you want me? Sure, I can go over them. Um, so Ingrid uh, Curris wrote, I appreciate the discussion about overdoing the message to stay out. I think it is important to tell folks to avoid swallowing and watch their kids accordingly. Depending on your situation, what do... What do people do instead of healthy outdoor recreation? If you close lakes more than is appropriate from the health risk. Um, and then I'll go into another comment. Um, the public has a difficult enough time gauging risk for themselves. So saying stay out if it's really green, which might be overprotective if toxins are present, reduces confusion in messaging. It is also a potentially beneficial if other pathogens like bacteria are present, as was the case in Wisconsin with a dense low toxin bloom that could occur with E. coli levels that cause GI illness. 
Uh, if you, if anybody wants to comment about anything that I'm reading, just raise your hand and I'll try to notice it. Um, the next one is in Oregon, our recreation program messaging focuses a lot on vulnerable populations, small children and dogs. Even our advisory press release devote a paragraph to this risk. I agree with Bridget. If you don't have a clue what the toxin levels are, you really can't be too careful. All it could, all it would take for, for a child to get to really sick or a dog dying. Those are it. I guess just to roll, I roll this forward. If there's a, a pause in the conversation, I would, you know, our situation in the Charles River is very specific, where we where we see these aphanosomin in blooms, and they, um, but the state is testing occasionally for microcystis, and you know, in 15 years of testing, there's you know not really been a positive a positive result for microcystin, and we're in this situation where there's um you know probably for a good reason kind of a hill to climb in terms of local expertise to understand okay well what is the toxin profile of this bloom that might be different than regional blooms um you know so so you know and at and that you know at the same time that you know this is a major a major kind of impediment to maybe appropriately to talking about, oh, can we establish, you know, swimming in the Charles River or, you know, how do we mm -hmm. deal with recreation on the river? So I just, I wonder what are other people, you know, do, do people see that this is a kind of a heavy, wonderful for this community that there's so much local expertise that's, that's needed everywhere, but, um, you, you know, it seems like that's the direction that we're headed and I, I wonder if anybody has you know, re reflect reflections on on that. Certainly, the safest way to go. I see that Ingrid uh, has her hand up. Yeah, thank you. I just wanted to comment that I think again, this depends so very much on the specific situation that you have. We have areas in Germany where there's there are campsites where people have their more or less permanent. Uh, camper van sighted there and they go there for several weeks on end in summer holidays and you see grandparents with kids, um, lower income families where you know you can start thinking about what will they be doing if you close down that campsite and will these kids be staying in the city indoors playing computer instead is that healthier it's it's really a kind of balancing benefits it's not, not just balancing risks and I really felt a bit bad when we started out on all of this research and then people started, you know, health authorities responsible started closing down rather than monitoring because it was just easier to close down or they didn't have the capacity to go monitoring as much as would have been appropriate. So I think it's really important to find ways to make risk assessment locally easier. And I think one good way to do it is if you don't have a lab, if you don't have access to a lab nearby, try to find someone with whom you can partner, even if it's a little bit farther away and maybe send samples, you know, just two or three times during the summer to get a rough idea of how toxic your bloom is because the genotype composition of a bloom will usually not change that quickly. So if you have a sample in July and one in August and one early in September, and you get the information back about some ratio of toxin to some parameter that reflects biomass, biovolume, chlorophyll, um, um, phyco, uh, what is it, um, the blue green pigment, whatever you can use um, to get an idea of the, the problem. I think that's really valuable. I think it's important um, not to keep people out of the water, especially if they don't really have a lot of alternatives. Now, if you have a lot of clear lakes nearby, I think it's a much easier decision than if perhaps you just have that one river and people have to drive for two hours until they get to the next site. So it's again, it's not one size fits all. Yeah, I think, sorry. I, I was just gonna say um, quickly, I think we're fortunate in Vermont um, to have a, a lot of areas to access the water and you can see what they're monitoring that most of the time our, our water in most areas is pretty good. Look, just looking at that volunteer, um, 
uh, data coming in. Um, and so it is fortunate that our, our guidance is really, you know, find a different place. There's likely a different place um, that's that's doing all right and you could use to recreate. And I, I think what Becky said about risk, uh, sharing risk earlier in her speech or talk that, you know, you, you want people to understand the level of risk and what their choices are and be informed about their choices. So if it's your, your family and you're all adults and you're just going to go for a little canoe ride, that's very different than having babies that are sitting on the beach all day. So I, on the Cape, we are lucky. We have a lot of water resources. And if people don't like the one in front of them, they just go down the street and there's another. So as you said, Ingrid, for them, it's different. And I totally agree for you. We have Hyannis, which is a more in urban and the ponds aren't well taken care of. And for those people, the opportunities are less. So I'm very careful with the one pond. Uh, you know, we don't close that one until we're absolutely sure, obviously, but I, we treat it differently and we, we put it in the triage system differently because we know that the people using it may not have any other choices. Uh, this is Shane. I'm interested to hear people's perspective about how much local politics drives decisions in these different cases. And I grew up in New York state and county government had a very sophisticated apparatus. They had a public health department. They had all these things. And I come to New Hampshire and I asked about some of those things and people chuckled <laughs> and said, yeah, yeah, we don't have that even as a county structure. And it seems like in New Hampshire, and maybe Northern New England, probably more than Southern New England, although maybe I'm wrong. There's a lot of things and decisions that are driven by local politics and local decisions. And Warren definitely is a, you know, an indicator of how much a local community can decide to do. But I'm just wondering what people see when you have these larger, broader terms, you have maybe the science or these different decisions, and then it confronts the reality of people who are there <laughs> in the town on the lake making decisions. So I don't know if anybody could speak to that in any way. Well, the, the local the local town uh, and town employees and so forth don't have a lot of expertise in this area. Uh, and so they are relying upon uh, the advice of, of others. Um, and uh, um, you know, I'm, I, I'm, I'm a chemist and I'm, I, may, I may be able to, to advise uh, people professionally on uh, toxic chemical risk assessment and pollution prevention and things like that, but I'm not a limnologist uh, and I'm not a microbiologist. Uh, and so uh, um, I, I feel comfortable in reading the articles and talking to people, but it's not my field at all. And so we don't have that. Uh, and uh, so we have to we have to rely, rely upon the, uh, the the knowledge, expertise, uh, and advice uh, uh, from uh, uh, people in like this collaborative uh, at DES, uh, at Bigelow Labs, uh, and uh, and and other organizations and meetings that we can uh, participate in. And I would say on the Cape, it's very political. And in the past, the squeaky wheel got the attention. So the ponds with elite uh, property owners often got the, the sampling and the treatments and um, all the, you know, all the goodies and the others didn't. So we're really trying to focus on making it equitable as possible. Obviously, cyanobacteria doesn't behave in those <laughs> parameters either. But um, yeah, it's very political and complicated and very local. Um, and as people have said, we're actually rare in Barnstable to even have people designated to look at cyanobacteria. That's a rarity. I mean, our local government is is largely nonpartisan, uh, and, uh, um, and and so obviously any town leaders have to take into account various political factors and so forth. Um, uh, but. Um, the values uh, about the, the, uh, our waters and the value of the waters to our town um, pretty uniformly uh, are shared across uh, uh, all the uh, elected uh, uh, officials in the lake and, and, uh, and the, the people working in the town departments. Um, and so, uh, and, and the voters, um, uh, you know, being in New Hampshire, 
um, the, the, the town, the town operating budget and, uh, uh, and every initiative, um, uh, uh, are, are before the voters every year. Um, and, uh, there've been a number of warrant articles that related to water quality or for the funding of our, of our activities. Uh, and they uh, continue to have broad, uh, support, uh, across the, uh, uh, the, uh, the town voters. Uh, and, and I might point out that in our town, we have many people who are landowners uh, and the people along the lakes are landowners who are not town voters. Uh, and so a, a large fraction of the taxes are paid by people who are not voters. So even the people who are not on the lake are, uh, uh, are voting by a large margin to uh, be protecting uh, the lakes. I just wanted to echo what um, Karen said uh, about, um, you know, trying to be equitable in our, our resources for, for where they're dedicated um, because just because, you know, a place has not um, reported a sign of bacteria bloom because, you know, there perhaps are other circumstances and not just, it's not because they haven't had a sign of bacteria bloom, it's because perhaps they're less educated and less aware of the risk. Um, so, so trying to spread that message out to places, especially that are unaware of the risks, um, rather than only the places that, um, are, that know about this and are, you know, speaking with their legislators and, and town councils about this. Um, I think that's a really good point. And we've been publishing more things in different languages. That's become really important because there are a lot of local families that fish in ponds that are not doing so well and um, Native Americans who harvest uh, freshwater mussels. So we, we're we trying to reach out. I don't have any Native American brochures, but they, you know, things like that. I'm trying to reach out to all communities. One concern we have uh, is that uh, uh, a significant number of people take their drinking water directly out of the lakes. Uh, and, um, and so in the event of a bloom, that, that, that could be a, uh, and, and release of toxin, that could be a real problem, uh, especially if what they do is try and boil their water uh, to uh, um, make it safe. Uh, and so uh, we try, we're trying to uh, make sure that we have communications that uh, would warn people that in the event of a bloom uh, to uh, not be drinking the water. Yeah, we also see that in um, Vermont, uh, folks on camps uh, uh, using the lake water, um, sometimes untreated as their drinking water. So we certainly try to discourage that or, um, you know, try to guide them towards treatment that will remove any toxins if they're present. Thanks uh, to all of our panelists for participating and all of you for uh, coming up with questions and, um, you know, leading the discussion. This was really good.